I will be chairing today. It's my pleasure to welcome Michel Nain and Frédéric Doquier, two of the organizers of these online seminar series. We're going to present a joint work with Michel Bierlea, who's not online with us today. I don't think that I need too much time to introduce the two of them. When I was a PhD student, I, I studied their papers, as a lot of us who are online today did. So it's truly a pleasure to have both of you online with us presenting your recent work. Michel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Simone. And I guess that uh, given the amount of quotation that you are going to receive in this presentation, you are the perfect chairman for, for this seminar. So this is a joint paper with Frédéric. Uh, I guess that most of the people uh, attending the presentation uh, know him. Michel Bierler is a professor of mathematics at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, Fédérale de Lausanne. So he is a, an expert in a discrete choice model, but he's also interested by transportation and uh, optimization. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it uh, today. So actually, before going to the, the technical details of this paper, because basically this is uh, some kind of a methodological paper, let me illustrate with a, a couple of pictures, maybe the main question that uh, we are going to be able to address uh, with this work. Uh, this picture is about basically the consequences of restrictions in the H-1B visa. We know that this is the main visa for skilled immigrants in the US. And we know that for 2004, the, the quota has been uh, binding and it is uh, increasingly binding over time. And so th the question is, what are the consequences of these restrictions in terms of the choice of the alternative locations for individuals that are going to be constrained by this H-1B visa? And actually, if you look at, uh, at this picture, the Canadian authorities, but also the Australian immigration authorities have used this type of restrictions to make some uh, advertising. And the, the, the first time that I saw such a picture, I was driving along a Californian highway. I, I was visiting uh, Giovanni Perry in Davis, and I saw a picture of these Canadian immigration authorities, and it was some kind of invitation to the individuals that could be constrained by the H-1B visa quota. And the implicit message was, if you are constrained, please apply for a Canadian visa. So the, the main question is not why does Canada or Australia do that, but why specifically Canada and Australia? We don't see this type of advertising in, for instance, European countries, while, of course, we could expect that uh, attracting skilled workers that are prevented to go to the US would be highly beneficial. And implicitly, it's maybe because the Canadian and the Australian immigration authorities perceive that their country is a close substitute to the U.S. destination and it's a, a closer substitute to the U.S. than many other countries in the world. And so this is basically the question that we are going to address in, uh, in this paper. It's how variation in the accessibility of specific locations affect the choice of locations of individuals. So I gave you the example of the H-1B visa. There are many uh, other examples of variation in uh, attractiveness of a specific location. So we address the question of the substitution by introducing a new model, which is called the cross-nested logic model, that And the, the main value added of this model is that uh, it allows to better capture the complex substitution patterns between alternative locations. And in fact, the reason why the, the, the cross-nested logic model, the CNL, better accounts for that, it's, it is because unlike, for instance, the multivariate logic model, it accounts for deviation in an important property, which is the property of independence from irrelevant alternatives. So I apologize for those who, who know, they must be numerous, uh, they, who know the uh, property of uh, IIA, but let me give you a quick reminder. So what is the property of IIA about? It's about the comparison between two menus of options or two choice sets. 
So in one choice set, suppose that you have three options, three, for instance, destinations, A, B, C, and in a second choice set, you have only two destinations. The IIA property states that when you move from the, the general choice set to the more restricted choice sets, the, the ratio of the probability of choosing A over B should be the same. Okay, and what does it mean in terms of words for international migration and the choice of locations? It means that if the US is no longer accessible and if IIA uh, uh, holds, it means that previous intended movers to the US will spread out equally in alternative locations. So these alternative locations will be perfect substitutes. The issue is that we most of us, we know that IIA is, is a simplification, it's a convenient property, but it's likely to be wrong because some locations are more substitutable uh, than others. And econometrically speaking, this is reflected in correlated errors across location, okay? The main issue is that the logic model, which is now uh, the most used model implicitly or explicitly to uh, do some analysis of international migration, the logic model of McFadden implies IIA. So we need to deviate from the logic model if we want to tackle specific question. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to argue that this is the case for analysis of international migration and choice of location using individual data, but also aggregate data. So aggregate data means the gravity model. So because I, I have a propensity to be too long on the on the, on the first part, I want to make sure that you have an idea of the results that we have in this paper. So the first result is that we show that the CNL statistically outperforms two competitors, so the traditional logic model, but also a two-nest logic model. So this is a model that has been considered recently by some authors in the literature to account for the imperfect substitution between the home locations and uh, all the other foreign locations. So we show that OCNL will outperform within sample uh, these two models, but also out, in terms of out of sample predictions. So the CNL will better predict the probability of choosing one particular location compared to these two models. Why does it matter? First of all, these models generate different elasticities. Okay? So if you are not interested by substitution patterns, you might say, why? Why do we go for a complicated model? It means it has implications also for the uh, estimates of the elasticities of the main determinants. So you might be willing to use a better model if you want to estimate more properly the effect of many determinants like income, uh, distance, and so on. And another result is that if we look at uh, how the, the multinomial logic performs, we see that the logic performs poorly. And one of the main reasons is that the, the logic uh, doesn't take into account the imperfect substitution between the home location and the foreign location. If you do a better job and you use a two-nest logic model, this is much better from that point of view. So for instance, the impact on the choice of the home location will be much better captured, but still you overlook the varying substitutions between the various foreign locations. And this is one of the main value added of the CNL that provides a solution to take into account the imperfect substituability between these foreign locations. And we do a simulation exercise uh, with the US. Okay, so rather than to give you a long list of many papers, and I mean, the, the, the literature on the determinants of migration is, is very, very extensive, as you know, let me give you a, a very quick preview of the literature through the use of uh, trees, decision trees. So basically all these models uh, are random utility maximization models, and they try to maximize the utility with two components, the deterministic component, and the stochastic component. The, the contribution of the, of the CNL is about a better modeling of the stochastic component. I will say something about the deterministic part of the model, because we need to talk about that. But 
And in the main value added is about the epsilon, the stochastic part of the underlying uh, utilities, okay? So if we start with the, the model that has been used in the literature, which is the multivariate logic, basically many, many papers, including mine, by the way, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that uh, I did a better job than, uh, than others. Basically, all the, the locations are on the same level, which means that the domestic location is considered as perfectly substitutable to any foreign location. So we know that this is not the case, and this is one major source of the deviation from the IIA hypothesis, because we know that home is a specific location. And basically, to a certain extent, we know that there is a home bias also, not only in trade, but also in international migration. So actually, the IIA property is clearly violated because we need to do something about the home location. One easy solution to deal with that is to get rid of the, the home location. So let me, yeah, I, maybe I forgot to say that, of course, this logic model is based on the specific distribution of the stochastic component of utilities, which is the, the, the traditional extreme value distribution of type one. Here, I'm going to, to present something on individual data, but what I would like you to understand is that it has also many implications for uh, gravity models that, uh, that use uh, aggregate data. And for instance, um, and a specific uh, issue on gravity model, which is the multilateral resistance to migration. And for instance, if you look at the, the paper of Simone and Rezus in GDE in 2013, you see that there is a connection between the choice of the underlying distribution of the stochastic component and the presence of multilateral resistance to migration. So, for instance, the multivariate extreme value distribution that we are going to use and which underlies the CNL model, they have shown that this results in gravity models to the presence of a multivariate resistance to migration terms that you need to take into account in the estimation, okay? So the first deviation from IIA is that home is a special location. So one easy solution to do that, to, to, to account for that, is to forget about the home, the home location. And to a certain extent, this is a good idea because we might suspect that IIA is going to be much more valid across foreign locations than between foreign locations and uh, the domestic location. The, the only drawback when you do that is that basically two main drawbacks. The first, the first drawback is that you change the question, okay? You are going to look at the determinants of a specific foreign location conditional on the fact that you have decided to leave your country, okay? And the second issue is that, and, and by the way, empirically speaking, if you look at the Gallup data that we are going to use in this paper, when you do that, you get rid of the most visited alternative. And this is true in any country of the world, okay? There is no country, to the best of my knowledge, for which one specific foreign location, for instance, the, the US, is going to dominate the, the home location, even in, in countries with huge rates of immigration. The second drawback is that the possibility of reducing the menu of options, the choice set, depends on the validity of IIA, okay? And of course, if IIA is, uh, theoretically speaking, if IIA is not valid, basically, it is not a good idea to reduce the choice set. So basically, the literature has uh, searched for a better solution. And so the, there were several recent papers that have looked specifically at the solution of dealing specifically with the home location. So you have the, the paper of uh, Thierry Mayer, uh, Matthias Tony, uh, Bugel uh, on the Jewish immigration in the 30s. You have a paper of Johan Mondras quite recently. Uh, uh, Giovanni Perry and uh, Frances Ortega did something about that uh, in a gravity model before. And for some specific question, this might be a very interesting structure. So for instance, I was thinking to, uh, to what extent in the Jewish immigration case you need to do more. It's not totally sure that they need to do more. The only drawback is that in many contexts, 
such a structure is going to be wrong. Why? Because it imposes that the substitution between all foreign potential locations is the same. So maybe in the case of the Jewish immigration in the 30s, it could be a, a, a more or less valid property. Huh? After all, if a German Jewish uh, wanted to leave Germany, maybe they consider Belgium, France, the UK, the Netherlands as basically equal substitutes. Okay, But for the question at stake, the, the, the question that, uh, that I was uh, talking about uh, before, this is not totally valid because we want to account for the different substitution or the fact that some foreign locations are going to be more similar than others. So how to do that? The next step is to partition the, the choice set of foreign locations. And what has been proposed uh, in the literature is, uh, is uh, a paper of uh, Simone and Rezus in 2015 uh, in the context of a gravity model when they partition the choice set of foreign location into specific nests. So each destination belongs to a nest. And this nest, or a particular nest, is going to include uh, foreign destinations that are supposed to, to be more similar in the unobserved component of utility. Okay, then when you do that, you, you face a couple of problems. One problem is, of course, how are you going to partition the choice set in a fixed way? Okay, you might use an heuristic approach, okay, but the question is to what extent is it robust? But there is also a, a more fun, fundamental problem is the, the problem of the curse of dimension. So if you want to adopt a data-driven partitioning uh, strategy, so you, you, you let uh, uh, the data speak about the partitioning of the choice set, this approach becomes very tricky because when you consider the number of potential locations, the, this number is really huge. So the, the number of possible combinations is going to be uh, tremendous. So uh, I, I just put the number here for uh, 86 potential locations. So we are going uh, to estimate the CNL with 86 potential locations, including many locations with zeros that are not chosen by individuals. It's a little bit like in gravity models, you need to include the zeros, but to a certain extent we cheat. And why we stick with 86 uh, locations because of computational uh, convenience. But Ideally speaking, we should include all the potential destinations. But if, if you stick with 86, you have this number of uh, possible combination of the partition of the choice set. So this is a nightmare in terms of... Uh, so to a certain extent, the CNL is going to provide an interesting approach. And what is the, the main feature of this approach is that we are going to use NEST. But these nests are going to be defined ex ante, okay, based on consensual categories of destinations. So consensual categories that have been discussed in the literature. And I'm going to detail these categories. And each destination is allowed to belong to several nests, okay? And uh, how do we do that in the, in the CNL is that there will be what we call participation parameters. So our categories are about how a set of foreign destinations share uh, some kind of similar features in the way people are going to choose these destinations. So for instance, we have these categories, let me find, sorry. Okay, uh, we, we have four categories and their complementary uh, set. And we define four uh, categories, OECD countries. Uh, and we consider that OECD countries are more similar than non-OECD countries. They have uh, some uh, similar features, not because OECD countries are richer, because this is going to be captured in the deterministic part of the model. So do not forget that everything here is about the, the unobserved part of the utility. But because these OECD countries, they share some features that are not directly uh, observed in the model, 
And for instance, we can think about they have more or less similar institutions. And by the way, to belong to the OECD club, you need to, at least at the beginning, you need to be a, a, a democracy, okay? The other categories follow the same idea, English speaking. Why? Because English speaking, so we are going to apply that to India. So English speaking, of course, it's important, but to a, to a certain extent, this is going to be accounted in the deterministic part, but also because English speaking destinations, they share a similar culture and a similar type of institution beyond language. And this might not be observed directly in the data. We have also the same for contiguity and for a European destination. European destination, it's because when you are allowed to go to Europe, you have access to a, a large set of countries because of the European free mobility. So the main hypothesis is the choice of these categories. So to give you an example, if I... So take, Michel, Michel yes. this is uh, David McKenzie. Uh, yes. So the, you, you know, mm. you said you were going to come back to this choice of the deterministic components. Yes. But obviously the two are highly related. I mean, in the sense that, how, you know, if I, def, if I measured, you know, whether you had, whether you were a member of the Commonwealth, whether you had a common law sort of type of, um, you know, institutions, whether, you know, you were a federal country versus a, a small country versus a large country, you know, a bunch of these things, then maybe I want to, you know, I, I'm controlling for those, and then I want to form these nests on the basis of who's got the best beaches and what's the weather like, and mm -hmm. um, you know other things that enter into the migration decision. And so, you know, it, it really, it, it, it you know, th this error term is just a measure of, as you say, of the unobserved things that I'm not controlling for that I think affect migration. And so, whatever. So, so before I've talked about what I am able to observe, it makes no sense to me to think about what I, you know, what's the best way of grouping what I don't observe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I guess the point is that the sort of same, uh, you know, I could equally model this by saying, you know, people care about where there's a high tech computer cluster. And so I should, you know, put, you know, Indian migrants into groups, depending on the sort of computer technology in those mm -hmm. countries. I could put them into groups based on these. So I, I don't know if you're going to give us more justification for yeah. you know, so why I mean, these groups. Yeah, I have two, re two, two replies, two different replies to your point, which is well taken. The first thing is that when we are going to use this nest, it's only about the second moment. It's only about the similarity across destination. But we are going to capture, for instance, the, an observed attractiveness of OECD through nest fixed effect. Okay, so for instance, you cannot claim that basically we capture the similarity because we didn't account for the attractiveness of this English speaking destination. Okay. Now, the, the second answer is that we are going to use exactly the same deterministic component in the model across the three competitors. Okay. So we use exactly the same deterministic component. So how can I say that? Of course, I, I, I take your point that uh, because we model an observed component, and this depends on how we are going to specify the deterministic part, but we, the, 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 this deterministic part is exactly the same in the logit, in the nested logit, and in the cross-nested logit. Yeah, this is my, uh, my main answer to your point. I don't know um, uh, if, uh, if this addresses uh, all the, 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 the points that you raised. So uh, how, technically speaking, how do we model the, the, the CNL? By choosing another distribution than the extreme value distribution. And this is the multivariate extreme value distribution that has been introduced. What is nice with the CNL is that it's going to nest the two competitors. So the, the, the two nest uh, logic model, when you treat the home location specifically, and the multivariate logic model. So we are able to, to conduct like filtration ratio test, and we will show that uh, it outperforms uh, the two competitors in the sample. The thing is that the, you have two important uh, parameters in this uh, distribution. This is uh, the alpha that I uh, explained, and uh, the mu m, which is the degree of similarity of specific destination within a nest. Okay, So you can put restrictions on these parameters to fall back on uh, the competitors, so the, the two nest 
a logit model and the multivariate logit model. I'm not going, so I will talk about that later on. Okay, yeah, so what is really important uh, to, to understand is that when you use the CNL, basically you are going to generate different substitutions. Why is that? Just quickly, when you use the logit model, which implies the property of IIA, another side of the coin is that it's going to have the property of proportionate shifting. What does it mean? It means that a change in the attractiveness of one particular destination, for instance, suppose that the US is booming and it becomes more attractive, it's going to induce the same relative change for all the other destination. So basically, if you look at this equation, it doesn't depend on J. It doesn't depend on the specific features of that particular location. While in the, the two nest logit model, but in the CNL, it will depend on how the specific location is framed in the nesting structure. So how you take into account the similarity of this specific location with respect the, uh, to the uh, alternative location, okay? So it will depend uh, on the, the mu and, and the alpha, okay? So, and we will exploit that. So this proportional shifting is not assumed, it's not an implication of the CNL uh, in contrast with the, the logic model. Can yes. I ask a quick clarifying question? Yes. So, um, I'm, I'm losing track a little bit of how many parameters you have to estimate in each of the different models, right? Uh, the, <clears throat> there's one, one elasticity of substitution in the multinomial logic. There's two in the two in the two nested. I'm not sure how many there are here, right? So, uh, in uh, uh, so in terms of additional parameters that you need to to estimate um, in the so the the, the two nest uh, logit model with respect to the the multinomial logit, you have one uh, additional parameters, which is the similarity in the foreign destination, and uh, for the CNL you have as many additional parameters than the number of nests. Okay. So we do not, uh, Johan, we do not estimate the alpha, of course. Huh? Well, with the alpha, and may maybe I, I skip the example because the example is important. I skip the example of the, of the UK. So basically, the alpha are chosen with respect to whether the, the destination is an OECD or a non-OECD country, an English speaking and so on and so on. So, and what we assume is that we are going to, uh, uh, so we have four potential nests for each destination and we are going to allocate uh, one fourth to each nest. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, the alphas you could have it on the two, in the two nested logic anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for instance, in, in the case of the UK, the UK, the alpha, for OECD will be one quarter because the UK is an OECD country, it is an English speaking country, it is a European country, and it is a non contiguous country. Okay, so it's straightforward to, to put the alpha. Uh, and one quick uh, yes? clarifying question, also, uh, quick follow up on that is when you say that the CNL performs better than the other ones. Is it adjusting for the number of parameters that each of the different models have? Yes, yes, because or is, you have, uh, unconditional. No, on no, no you, you, because you have a like a maximum likelihood ratio test. Okay, so I'm going to show you that. Yes, thanks. You're welcome. So the specific uh, to the deterministic part of the the utility. So in this, as you have understood, I hope we try to model both the probability of immigration and the choice of the foreign location. So for the, the choice of immigration, or if you want the choice of the home location, we are going to uh, account for the, the traditional determinants, age, income at origin, network, marital status, uh, the type of location. So whether you, are, you have an urban or a non-urban location, the education level. And for the choice of the foreign destination, we are going to use destination-specific covariates uh, determinants. Sometimes they will not vary across individuals, like uh, income and destination or the, 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 the size of the diaspora, but sometimes they are going to be individual-specific. So for instance, we have an individual-specific measure of distance because we have the location of each individual in India in the Gallup data. And we also account for religious proximity. 
And because we have the declared faith of the individual, we build a measure of uh, religious proximity between the individual and each potential location uh, in the world, okay? So what is important also to, to see is that these destination specific variables are interacted with the level of education and we have three levels of education, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So in my reply to David, I, I stress that uh, we have nest, nest specific constant, okay? So alternative specific constant for each nest, which means that we are going to capture the additional attractiveness of belonging to one particular nest. So for instance, being an OECD destination. So once again, this is capturing the deterministic part. So the, the, the nesting structure is going to be more about the correlation between the destination that are included in that nest. So we apply that to India. And we use intention data, uh, that, uh, the, so the Gallup data. So I guess that uh, a lot of people know uh, quite well uh, how the, the Gallup data are structured. So we use the Gallup data over a, a period of 10 years, which means that we have more than uh, 30,000 usable observations at the individual level. So India is a specific case in the sense that it is a country with a lot of intended stayers, 94%. And, there are several explanations in the literature, the size of the country, so the scope of internal migration, the insurance schemes. Uh, there is the paper of uh, Rosenzweig and Munchi about that. But so in, in some sense, we, we made our life a little bit more tricky because this is a difficult case. Basically, only 6% of the respondents have a desire uh, of uh, immigration. Okay? And so let me uh, look a little bit at the results. So... Actually, if you look at the qualitative differences between the three models that we are going to estimate, the CNL, the, the two nest logit model and the multivariate logit, uh, prima facie, there, there are not a lot of uh, differences. But the thing is that these models are nonlinear, so you need to compute uh, the marginal effect and the, the elasticities, and then we see some differences. But the qualitative differences are tiny, the only main difference that we see is that in the choice of the foreign location, the two competitors were unable to capture the, the higher attractiveness of OECD countries. Okay? But I don't want to emphasize too much the point estimates. I want more to emphasize the implication of the CNL. So the first thing is that the CNL strongly outperforms within sample the, the two competitors. So when we conduct the likelihood ratio test, against the, the two nest logit or the, the multivariate logit, we have a clear rejection of uh, these two competitors with a very small p-values. Furthermore, we can look directly at the estimates of the, of the degree of similarities for each nest that we, that we chose. So for instance, we have statistical support for having more similarity within the nest of uh, European uh, destination, OECD destination, and so on and so on. Something which is important is that even though you don't see many qualitative differences, elasticities are different, okay? So let me just show you one example for income, which is one of the main determinants. So if you look at the right-hand side of the panel here, and we look at the comparison of elasticities to a variation of a 10% increase in the U.S. income, if you look at a whole, the logic is going to capture the increase in the number of aspiring migrants to the U.S., it's clearly going to overestimate this impact of the increase in the U.S. So if you look at the, the comparison between the NL and the CNL, it seems that it is more or less similar. But at the individual level, you see a lot of differences. So just to illustrate graphically. For instance, if I look at the elasticities of income for the two models, so on the horizontal axis, you have the elasticity captured by the, the nested logit model, and on the 
vertical axis, it's the, the CNL. You see that across all education levels, you have differences, and it seems that the, the CNL uh, has a higher estimate uh, in general than uh, the, the NL. But if you look at, for instance, specifically the college educated individuals, this is the reverse. So it's what I wanted to stress is that you have differences in elasticities. Now, getting back to the comparison between the, 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 the model, so uh, I showed you that the likelihood ratio has support the CNL. Oh, in terms of out of sample, we carried out an out of sample prediction exercise. And I don't want to, to give too much details. So I, I can get back to that. But clearly, the CNL is doing better than the, the competitor. The main interesting implication of the CNL is what I stressed before. It's the substitution patterns. So on the left hand side of this panel, you have uh, already a preview of this substitution pattern. So look at uh, how the, the three models are going to capture the impact of an increase in income in the US on the number of people willing to stay in India. And you see that clearly the multivariate logic model is going to overestimate this effect. And why is that? Because the logic model does not take uh, into account the imperfect substituability of the home location with the foreign location. And even the two nest logic model does a much better job, okay? Because it takes into account this imperfect substitution. The- so, Sorry, Michel, can you just tell us what, like, yes. how should we think of standard errors on these? Uh, this is uh, the average of individual elasticities. I mean, I'm, I'm used to looking at minus 1.1 and, point, and yeah. minus 0.9 and thinking, yeah, those are pretty similar. Like, you, you know, yeah, certainly yeah. most models we estimate, we would mm. think that those Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, we, we, should, uh, we should report some kind of uncertainty about, uh, about these average estimates. Okay. I do not have that uh, right now. Okay, now about the substitution, this is, I think, the, the most important thing uh, is uh, how the, the, the different models are going to capture this imperfect substitution. We simulate the effect of a counterfactual scenario. We suppose that the US borders are closed for Indian respondents, okay? To a certain extent, this is not science fiction, because if you remember what happened in 2017 for a couple of Asian countries, I guess, uh, the Middle East countries, it was exactly the type of uh, thing that happened to them. So what we do is that we compute the variation in the choices of alternative locations, including the home location, okay? So I gave you an idea about how it's going to be captured for the home location. Now it's important to see the differences across the choice of foreign location. So this is exactly what I, I was saying about the logic, so the, the horizontal axis is a whole each, so each diamond represents a foreign destination. The change in the, change in the choice, the number of, or the proportion of uh, respondents that uh, choose one specific location, okay, foreign location. Uh, on the vertical axis, it is the implication of the CNN. What you see is that the logit, and this is a manifestation of the proportion of shifting property, it is almost a straight line, okay? So what, what does it mean? It means that when you close the US borders, it's going to be spread out equally across foreign locations, okay? The, the CNL has a much more heterogeneous response in terms of foreign location. Let's look at the two nest logit model against the CNL. Once again, the two nest logit model does a good job for the home location. But for the foreign location, you see that basically the, of course, it's not a straight line, but the implied increase in, in the proportion of people choosing each foreign location will be more or less the same, around 40%. Once again, the TNL is going to have a much more heterogeneous capture of this substitution. Now, each diamond, so you do not have the label of the diamond. So you, you might say, yes, Michel, uh, okay, but what is this diamond uh, uh, for which the increase uh, of the, the respondent is, so, is uh, about 70%? So what we should expect is that these are the destinations that are considered as close substitute 
to the US that are going to benefit the most from this uh, increase. So how can we see how uh, the destinations are more substitutable to the US? We capture that by the number of common nests that they share with the US. I have to be cautious here because there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of nests that you share with the US and the degree of similarity, the degree of substitution, but of course this is highly related. So you see that, for instance, if I take Canada and Australia that share exactly the same number of nests with the US, they are OECD, English-speaking, non-European, and non-contiguous, okay, you see how the different models are going to capture the substitution in favor of this location. You see that the logit is going to do a very bad job. The two-nest logit model is going to capture the increase in these locations, but it's not very different from other locations like uh, United Arab Emirates or Japan, or even to a certain extent, Pakistan. So basically, it doesn't capture the different degrees of substitution between foreign locations. And you see that the CNL is going to have a much more heterogeneous response. And in general, I mean, the highest increase is observed for the locations that share the highest number uh, of nests with the US. So of course, it is intentions. So what does it mean in if we want to, to translate that in immigration pressures. So to what extent does it matter? Okay. And so what we have done is we have looked at the correspondence of the structure of the sample in the Gallup data and the population of India to translate uh, all figures into immigration pressures. So for instance, if you look at uh, what we find for the UK, for the UK, if you believe our numbers, and of course these are intentions. Uh, so. Uh, we know that, but if you believe our numbers, the, the logic model would imply that if the US closed the border, it would imply about 150,000 more people from India willing to go to the UK. But if you look at the, the two other models, the, the two NAS logic, it's almost 2 million. But still, it underestimates the amount by a significant margin because in the CNL it is 2.6 million. So what we claim, of course, you, we need to be cautious about these numbers, but uh, what we claim is that if countries are interested by looking at the consequences of a variation in attractiveness in one particular country on their immigration pressure, they are better off using uh, a good model, okay? Anyway, so I think I'm almost done. I didn't forget anything, no? Okay. So I am almost there, Simone, so I can yes. simply conclude. So what I presented is a, a new model, which is applied to location choices, and it better accounts for deviation from the IIA. The, the main value added is that this model is going to capture more realistic substitution patterns between destinations. One thing is that by using overlapping nest, it provides also a much more convenient way of partitioning the choice set of, of foreign locations, because if you do not adopt overlapping nest, it's going to be almost impossible to partition the, the choice set into fixed nest, or basically you need, uh, so it's very, it's very complicated. And the main hypothesis, of course, that we adopt is that the choice of consensual categories. So I'm not saying that we could have, uh, we, there are no other uh, possible ways of defining these categories, but at least uh, we, we, we could try also uh, additional categories. And the next extension is uh, maybe to go further in uh, pooling. Everything that I presented is origin specific, so maybe to do something uh, that would not be uh, totally origin specific to get closer to the, the, the concept of uh, a gravity model. But uh, of course, this is left for uh, a future research. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Michel. Now the floor is open to questions. I can take the privilege of asking the, the first one. I was thinking about the, the behavioral interpretation of the cross nested logic model. Because if I think about the, the nested logic model, Alortag and Perry, so with two nests, 
the, the interpretation is that people are heterogeneous with respect to the psychological cost of migrating. There are some to, to any destination. Okay, so this kind of heterogeneity naturally leads to that to their nesting structure. So I was thinking what you can tell with respect to where these your nesting structure comes from. Not totally sure that I understood your question in the sense that so do you do you, so of course it's a, the, the nesting structure reflects the way these respondents see the similarity across uh, particular locations. So as I said, for instance, when, when we, we adopt the nest of OECD countries, it's of course they go to OECD countries because these are rich countries, but this is captured by the, by the, the deterministic part of the model, but also because they have uh, specific similar institutions, so uh, high quality institutions compared to non-OECD countries. So if basically they are prevented to go to one specific OECD destination, they will be more willing to go to an alternative OECD destination because they share some similarity in this institution. I don't know if I... I no, I you, 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 you have partly answered. So let, let me just rephrase. So the OECD nest, you also have a, a fixed effect for this nest of destination. Okay, yes. so the average attractiveness of OECD destinations for unobserved reasons is controlled for. So my question was, I could rephrase it as follows. Is a, a, a characteristics on the basis of which you determine a nest something with respect to which potential migrants have heterogeneous preferences? Some love that characteristics, other hate that characteristic. Mm -hmm. should, should I think of, of the cross-nested logic in, in these terms? I think that it's a right interpretation. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, I have to think more about that, but I think that I, I would buy this type of interpretation. Yes. Thanks, Michel. But perhaps you could say that in, if a model was perfectly specified, huh? suppose that you have all the determinants uh, affecting migration decisions, then maybe the IIA would be something which is totally acceptable. The fact that the model is by definition misspecified or related to one of your papers that uh, people have the capacity to uh, collect information for a subset of countries only, then you have this fixed effect capturing the, the, the average attractivity of uh, one nest, but you have also the possibility that uh, you have plenty of unobserved characteristics belonging to these, uh, to these nests and that are correlated between them. So they exhibit a specific correlation compared to the, the characteristics unobserved belonging to different nests or for countries belonging to different nests. So that's, I think, the way you, you motivate a bit your studies as well. And here is just a generalization of, of what you did. Thanks, Fred. So can I, I just ask on that um, part about the fixed effects? You did not have those fixed effects in the logit model or the nested logit model. And so I, it's hard to tell how much is coming. No, it, it is there. It is there. The, the, the nest fixed effects are? Yeah, because you, it, can, you can put, it's actually, actually it is a nest specific constant. So basically you can identify what are the, the OECD countries and you can put a, a specific dummy for these OECD countries, even in the logit model. So it is in the logit model. Okay, great. I, I was that wasn't clear, sorry. And uh, it is also, of course, in the in the two nests. So we have exactly the same structure of the covariates and the same structure of these uh, nest specific constant in the deterministic part of the model. One more question, question yes, or suggestion on the out of, out of sample test would, you know, my I I had thought when you were saying oh we'll do some out of sample things that what you would do would be to take okay, we've got the Gallup data every year, let's fit the model on the uh, first yeah. three years of data and then let's use it to predict the aspirations in the next three years of data and see yeah. how, how good we are at, at that. Because, you know, comparing the log likelihood ratios, you know, they're different, one's better than another, but we have no sense of magnitude there, yeah. right? Uh, it, it's actually speaking, when I, when I talked with Frédéric and Michel, it was my view of doing the old sample, but this is a cross section. So in, in that sense, what Michel proposed is that let's take the full sample, let's partition the full sample in five 
a different subsample. Let's estimate the model on four of the five subsample and apply this model on the on the remaining uh, subsample. And let's look, and then you can sum the, the log likelihoods and to compare that. So to, to the extent that it is a cross section, I guess that it would be more or less, uh, I, I don't see many, many differences between doing that and doing what you propose, but, but maybe it's a good point. But it, since it is a, a cross section, we do not take really time into account only when we, we look at uh, destination specific variables like income, we match actually the, the data on income with the, the date of the, the wave in the Gallup data to which the, the respondent belongs to. Okay, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, sorry, I, I wasn't clear on, on this bit, but I, I think the point was more in terms of interpretation. Like, you know, when you say one log likelihood is 8187 and another one's 81. For eight, if you showed me instead, you know, thinking about, you know, the specificity and precision of, you know, if, if you sort of say, okay, let's, can we, we predicted 84% of the people who wanted to go to Canada with one model and, you know, 68% on another. And I know it's, you need to set thresholds and it's tricky. And, you know, this is why we use log likelihoods and things. But I think in terms of, you know, if I was actually use this as a policymaker, thinking about this as a prediction tool, and I fitted your model on some years or on part of the data, and then I wanted to use it to say, what's, you know, how accurate am I going to be at getting the total number of people who are going to go, you know, say they want to go um, to each of these destinations, just showing us that I think would give us a sense of um, that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't need to necessarily set the thresholds, I guess, there if you, if you, you're aggregating that up and sort of saying, okay, this model predicted this many people going to England, this, this model predicted that many people going to England. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just a suggestion in terms of yeah, how yeah. to okay, thank you. give us a sense of magnitudes. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Uh, hi, Michelle, Th thanks, thanks a lot for the presentation. It's uh, really interesting. So I, I would like you to talk a little bit about the trade-off that we also face in our paper, uh, estimating uh, this type of model with multiple nests. So what is your take on this uh, trade-off between the number of nests? So uh, uh, if we uh, increase the number of nests, we are, of course, gonna, we are going to feed better, but uh, at the cost of uh, losing precision. So how are you looking uh, at that in, the, in this paper with the cross nest state logic? Because here you could also think of increasing the number of nests. You're going to uh, estimate more mu parameters. But uh, yeah, I would like you to talk a little bit about this trade-off. Yeah, this is, I think that it is, it is a, a key question. Where, where do we stop? My, my, my only response at this stage is that I will start from, let's say, from the literature and maybe to try to see how the literature has identified sets of destinations and what are the, the common features of these sets of destinations. And from this evaluation of the literature, I would choose the categories. Okay, so if you are telling me that there is one missing category which is of high importance and which has been identified in the literature, I would totally uh, agree to, to increase the categories. I would prefer to have uh, something which is driven uh, by the previous literature rather than uh, something which is based only on the data. Because as, as you said, uh, if I create more and more categories, I mean, I'm going to increase, uh, increase the fit. On the other hand, we, we have also the, the estimates of the mu M, and so you can carry out uh, individual tests on these parameters. So it could be that, so I, I didn't have time to show the, the significance of these parameters, but we find support for five nest out of eight. So there is also some uh, statistical validation about that. But I, I would prefer to, to, to start from the evaluation of the literature uh, rather than uh, some kind of a data-driven approach. Okay, Thank thanks you. a lot, Michelle and Frederick. It's 6.30 p.m. here in Europe, so I would like to, to call the day and thank you one, once more for a very interesting presentation and interesting exchanges with, uh, with a number of panelists. Uh, thank you very much for the many questions. Uh, very, very useful. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.